Hello, today we shall learn how children learn environmental science. What are the different ways through which children learn environmental science? The pedagogies in which children can be engaged with reference to learning. Now, you know that a large number of philosophers have written about child-centered education and how children learn. For example, Froebel has written that children are interested in real life tasks and activities, pretending and fantasy and rules and rituals. That means they like to engage in real life tasks and activities. They like pretending and fantasy and they like rules and rituals. Then John Dewey has said that school life should grow out of home life. Teachers should know their children well, observe them and then plan, organize and document a purposeful curriculum. That means it is very, very important for us as teachers to understand the context of the child. If you understand the context of the child, you can then include those activities, those real life experiences which the child can relate to. This planning of curriculum shall enable the curriculum being, being meaningful and being purposeful for the students. Then if we move ahead, we have Maria Montessori. She says that, and she said that the role of the parent and the teacher is to be aware of these sensitive periods and design the curriculum to give the child the full opportunity to concentrate on those things the child is interested in. Children learn from the environment around them. That means with reference to environmental science, when we look at it, we have to understand which are these sensitive periods of the, in, in the child's life where the child should be engaged all throughout these activities which the child sees in and around himself or herself. Then Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi, he said, the process of learning should be as far as possible a pleasurable one and not laborious. If children find learning a burden, if children find learning something which is an effort to be made, something which is not joyful, something which is not pleasurable, then the joy of learning is far and the retention is also not there. Therefore, learning ought to be an exercise where the child engages in something meaningful and something joyful. If we look at the educational thought of Sri Aurobindo, he has said, educational thought lays emphasis on holistic development of children and education paced according to the needs and capacities of the child. That means it is extremely important for us educators and teachers to look at the, when we say development of the mind, body and spirit, we need to see what are the needs of the child. We need to see what are the capacities which we need to develop in the child. And therefore, we need to ensure the holistic development of the children through the curriculum. And Tagore, the great naturalist philosopher and a Nobel laureate from India has said, the child learns so easily because he has a natural gift. But adults, because they are tyrants, ignore natural gifts and say that children must learn through the same process that they learned by. We insist upon forced mental feeding and our lessons become a form of torture. This is one of man's most cruel and wasteful mistakes. Now, if we go into the depth of this quote by Tagore, it clearly tells us that it is extremely important that children are given a natural setting. It is important to create a learner readiness for the child to learn and forceful feeding of information, of irrelevant information, of information which the child cannot relate to is nothing but a torture for the child. And this is what we keep on doing in the name of education. And therefore it becomes a mistake, a complete mistake and an effort which is wasteful and if you see the larger picture, cruel as well as it leads to the child being emotionally and mentally drained. Moving further, there are many researches which have established, you know, that children learn differently from adults. You cannot have a pedagogy of a child and andragogy of an adult, which is the same. They learn differently. 
children learn through real life contexts, right? Their context which they can relate to, the context which is their immediate context, the context from which they see life's experiences and thus learn from them. And most importantly, as John Dewey always said, children learn by doing. By engaging children on hands of activities, we make children learn or they learn themselves by engaging in those activities. They learn from their surroundings and their environment. Most of the philosophers have time and again given us the relevance of the naturalistic surroundings. That let the child be in the naturalistic surroundings such that the child learns. Surroundings have enough teaching learning material, cost effective teaching learning material which you can utilize as environmental science teachers to make them learn. And by reconstructing and constructing meanings from experiences in their environment. For example, when you take them for nature walks, you take them for field trips, you take, uh, ask them to write creative expressions. It is very important that when you engage them in these kind of constructivist activities, you have a discussion on them. And from their experiences, you learn or you construct meaning with reference to their environment. So it is very important to, for us educators to know that children have different ways of learning, unlike adults. Then all children, NCF 2005 has said very clearly that all children are naturally motivated to learn and are capable of learning. This is very important for us educators and teachers to understand. Never should you give a child a label that this child is not capable of learning. Each one of them has a natural inborn motivation to learn and they are all capable. So let us not give these labels to children with reference to they not being capable of learning. Each one of them is capable, each one of them is motivated and we need to create the right kind of teaching learning environment for them such that they learn to the best of their capacities. Then making meaning out of what they learn, it is very very important that whatever we learn we understand that this is relevant for us. We understand that this is what we can use in our life. And we know that once I learn this, this will be productive. This will be something which I can use in my life. Therefore, forming those connections with my real life is very, very important for any learning to take place. And of course, developing the capacity for abstract thinking, reflection are important aspects of learning. If you're able to take a child from concrete experience to an abstract one such that the child can visualize and understand different aspects of a problem by engaging in critical thinking and on reflecting on the problem on hand then these are important aspects of learning which you have achieved and it's very important that through environmental science you engage students in such a way that their abstract thinking their critical thinking and their reflection on different aspects of the environment are an important part of their learning experience. Now, we all know that children learn in a variety of ways through experience, making and doing things. We all love to experiment, to engage and we learn when we do things ourselves. Therefore, it is very important that you give ample opportunities to children to engage in experimentation. As teachers of environmental science, it is not only important to demonstrate but it is also extremely important to give them individual ex experiences of experimenting in a laboratory, right? Then children also learn very well by reading, right? By discussion, by asking, questions ignite the mind. Therefore, it is very, very important that we have a teaching learning environment where children's voices are not only listened to, but they are also motivated to ask questions, right? Once they learn to ask questions, then we move to the next aspect of developing their critical thinking. Criti One of the very important ways of developing critical thinking is by making them ask questions and also to hear those questions which they raise and making them reflect on the questions and the answers after the discussions are held. Children also learn by expressing oneself in speech, in movement or writing, both individually and with others. That means either you have individual activities or you have group activities of children wherein you engage them with reference to their speech, you engage them in movement 
or in writing. We as teacher educators and we as teachers in schools, we need to give opportunities to our children such that all kinds of the above activities are part of their course of development. Now, if we move further that adults learn differently than children, we need to know that adults learn mostly with a cognitive approach, emphasizing on learning of concepts, principles and problem solving and gain mastery over the content area. He or she understands the benefit needed to be derived from learning areas, focusing on transfer of knowledge seriously. This is how adults are different than children. The need of the adult decides the area of learning and he or she learns with intention and constructs knowledge. However, if you see, the child is not very serious or a willing learner. The situation influences him or her to formulate knowledge by interacting with environmental forces acting around. Influence of superiors, peers, teachers and their natural inquisitiveness and curiosity create learning situations for young learners mostly in societal contexts. Trial and error, habituation, intuition also play a role in his or her learning so as to formulate as well as to apply knowledge in identical situations. That means children are conditioned or they see something in action and they model that behavior, right? They have a lot of influences on them which formulate their knowledge or which enable them to construct their knowledge from their immediate context. Environment plays a very, very important role in the life of a child with reference to the learning which takes place. In making children learn, it is extremely important to relate the content being taught with their own life experiences and to engage them in activities they find interesting. And in environmental science, there are plethora of activities which you can engage your students with such that they are motivated to learn better. Interesting activities, for example, segregation of waste, segregation of garbage, you have making of a solar water heater or you can have a small model of a hydroelectric power plant. You can engage them in activities of rainwater harvesting. You can engage them with reference to the switching off of lights, conservation of water and then ask them that how much you know their, their conservation efforts led to with reference to for example when they learn uh, by conservation of electricity by CFLs then let them uh, ask uh, the teacher should ask them. Compare your electricity bills of the previous month with this year with reference to the when you've put CFLs in your homes. And then, you know, it gives them a clear indication with reference to how conservation of power can be, uh, can have a direct link with reference to putting the CFL bulbs. So, engaging them in hands-on activities as a teacher is very, very important. Many things when we teach and they are not able to draw their connections with their immediate environment, they are unable to believe, therefore to establish those connections, to establish the cause and effect relationship, it is very, very important that we engage them in experimentation, small experimentation, such that they are able to understand the cause and effect relationships. And when you teach them giving real life examples, they are not only able to understand the concepts, but there is better retention too. Long term memory has those concepts retained for a long time because they have done it with them or hands and they relate to it and thus they are able to retain it better. Now we also need to know that environmental science has some very unique features as a subject. First of all, it is very interdisciplinary. For example, you can relate environmental science to geography. You can relate environmental science to economics. You can relate environmental science to science. You can relate environmental science to politics. For example, all your bills with reference to environmental science are passed by the Ministry of Environment and Forests. So you can relate environmental science to every other subject because it's something which is so interdisciplinary and it is Another thing about it is that it is very contextual. We can relate to the contexts. Why? Because 
environment is all around us, whether it's our physical environment, whether it's our social environment. And it is a subject which is very child-centered. Therefore, it is very important for us to know that the pedagogy itself is also child-centered. We need to teach children right from the beginning the values, the attitudes which foster conservation of natural resources, which foster respect for our immediate environment. And another very unique aspect of this discipline is there is no absolute right or wrong. There are many opinions with reference to environmental science which are welcome. Therefore, it is also a liberal discipline. It is a discipline which engages the child into a lot of critical thinking. Critical thinking in aspects of conservation, critical thinking in aspects of preservation, critical thinking with reference to how to develop modules or how to develop programs such that we create a creed of educators, we create a creed of children who are naturally motivated to conserve and preserve our natural environment. Values are an integral part of EVS. As we discussed, the value of Vasudev Kutumbakam, where we say that all of us are the progeny of the Mother Earth. We are one large family with a common ancestry and we are all interdependent on each other. So values are inherent with reference to environmental science. So these are the unique features of this discipline called environmental science. Now, there are some things which you need to keep in mind as teachers, practicing teachers of environmental science. You have this wonderful opportunity, first of all, to observe your students very keenly to reaffirm learning processes and styles of children. You know, you can see children engaged in activities, you can see children engaged in projects, you can see children uh, engaged in problem solving, you can also see the different learning styles of children. There are some children who learn very uh, well by the auditory mode, there are some children who learn very well by the visual mode, there are some children who learn very well by the kinesthetic mode and there are some who learn by a mix of different modes. Right? So your teaching styles also have to have a variety such that you cater to the learning styles of children, especially in the early adolescent years. However, you will be able to make these observations meaningful only when you inform yourself as a teacher, why should I learn about how children learn? It is very, very important for you as a teacher to think about it and to reflect yourself that why should you know how children learn? As educators, one can have very different answers to this question. However, one should know that one's answer to this question may largely influence the way one perceives, understands and transacts environmental science. Your answer to this question will also help you to appreciate the pedagogical considerations for environmental science. It is very, very important that you understand that environmental science is a subject which has to move beyond the classroom and beyond the te textbook. You cannot have the entire pedagogy of environmental science centered around the textbook. Children need to see what is happening in their immediate surroundings. Children need to observe their environment. They need to engage in investigating skills such that they are able to make connections with their immediate environment. Also, as EVS teachers, you need to remember that it is important to make the child experience his or her immediate environment. Very, very important. Make the child sensitive to the order and beauty of nature. Let them see the rhythm in nature. Let them see the beauty of the order in nature. Let them see the beauty of the flowers, of the diversity of insects, birds, that kind of diversity which nature offers us. And let the child engage in exploration activities for themselves. When children discover things for themselves, their joy is multiplied. Therefore, it is extremely important for us as educators to engage them in exploration activities. And one should have a mix of individual and group learning activities. When you have a in mix of individual and group learning activities, it caters to 
both the kinds of children. In the sense, children who prefer to be engaged in individual activities and children who like to engage in group learning activities. So it's important that you engage children in both type of activities. And would it also be very interesting if you could group children with reference to their hemispheric orientation. In the sense, the left and the right hemisphere of the brain, we have different learning styles. If you group children according to that, that also makes the group very, very complete and lively and something which give, brings out the capacities of the groups as a whole. Above all, inculcate attitudes. It's not easy to inculcate attitudes, but if we begin right at the formative years, right in the beginning, we can inculcate for sure the right attitudes for the conservation of natural resources. If we are able to inculcate positive attitudes with reference to conservation of natural resources, you will not find children plucking flowers. You will not find plants drying out of water. You will not find children, you know, hitting stray animals. You will not find children or ad uh, as adults further, you know, not uh, wasting, you will not wa find them wasting water or, you know, not caring for the environment such as air, contributing to air pollution. So this inculcation of attitude is very, very important and we have to start right in the formative years. Now I would like to read a very beautiful poem to you, right? This poem has been written by Sylvia Strutz and it's entitled Want, which brings out the essence of conservation and of what we do with the environment and the bounty of nature. The sands of time have rendered fear. Blue skies on high no longer clear. Stars were bright whence they came. Now dimmed, obscured, pollution's haze. Crystal clear our waters gleamed. Fish abundant, rivers streamed. Ocean floors sandy white. Now littered, brown, pollution's blight. Look at how the uh, poet has given you a clear indication of what it was and what it is becoming. That initially we had blue skies which were clear, which we could see that stars shining bright. And now because of the pollution says it's all dimmed out. The waters were crystal clear. We could see the fish in abundance in the rivers and the streams. And the ocean floors could be clearly seen. But now they too are littered and they are brown because of pollution's plight. Then trees starred high above, trunks barring professed love, birds chirping from sights unseen, gone, paper joined, pollution steam. One can't blame pollution alone. As they say, you reap what you've sown. So let us plant a better seed, tear out old roots, cultivate wheat. It's very, very important that we understand the essence of the poem which the poet Sylvia Strutz has written, warned. She's warning us that we need to conserve. Otherwise, there is no use of blaming each other as ultimately you sow what you reap. So if you plant trees, if you plant seeds, you have trees. And if you want to see birds chirping, high towering trees, then we need to conserve. We need to have cultivation, which is productive. We need to stop the destruction of our natural resources. And this poem also brings out, you know, this is a creative expression. I've read out this poem to you because I wanted to tell you how these poems can be used as a mode and how children can be made to learn through poems also in environmental science. With these words, today we have learned how children learn. What are the different dynamics which children learn through and what are the different ways which, which th children learn? Keep this in mind to make your teaching learning engaging. Keep this in mind to make your teaching learning more meaningful and above all so that it is joyful and learning remains with the children for a long amount of their time such that they become champions in the cause of nature and live harmony or in sync with nature. It is very important as teachers to make children learn 
such that they learn to conserve their nature. They learn to see earth as their mother. And if you learn to see earth as your mother, you learn the art of conservation. You learn to love and care for Mother Earth unconditionally. Therefore, it is very important as pedagogues to understand the essence of how children learn. We should learn that children always learn by making connections with their immediate environment. Children learn by a meaningful engagement in activities. Children learn by experimentation and children learn by meaningful engagement in loads of activities with their immediate environment beyond classrooms and textbooks as well. Thank you very much. Today we learned how children learned with reference to environmental science as an interdisciplinary subject. Thank you very much.